your Bibles to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26. There's a lot going on in this chapter, the institution of the Lord's Supper. Jesus is betrayed and arrested. We want to look at verses 31 through 35 to begin with. And then we're going to get into some more of the text and some supporting passages. Then said Jesus unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night, for it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. But after I am risen again, I will go before you into Galilee. Peter answered and said unto him, Though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet I will never be offended. Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, that this night before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. Peter said unto him, Though I should die with thee, yet will I not deny thee. Likewise also said all the disciples. You know, this really starts back in chapter 20, uh, chapter 16, along about verse 20, 22. Jesus reveals at that time that he's going to suffer death on the cross. And at that point, Peter actually rebukes him and says, not so, that's not, that's not going to happen. Be it far from you. And so then at that point, Jesus says, get thee behind me, Satan. Uh, why was Peter so upset with this news and so adamant that, no, it's not going to happen? And then over here, Jesus flat out says, y'all are all going to be offended. Are, to this night, y'all are all going to be offended. And he tells them the scripture, the Old Testament passage that prophesies the event. But Peter says, no, not me. Though everybody else be offended, not me. And he's so, I guess, forceful and persuasive that the other disciples even began to say the same thing. And then it's interesting, Jesus' response. You're going to deny me three times before the cock even crows. In other words, before the next morning, when the chickens get up, and the rooster crows, Peter, you're going to deny me three times. Well, Peter's like not having any of it. But why, why is Peter so adamant here? Could it be that he's thinking that God's not in control? Here's the Messiah, and the Messiah's fixed to be killed off. That can't happen. It doesn't fit Peter's preconceived idea of what the Messiah is supposed to be about. Most of the Jewish people at that time believed that when Jesus, well, the Messiah, because a lot of them rejected him, in fact, most did. At that time, they had a preconceived idea that when the Messiah came, that he was going to deliver them from Roman oppression and reestablish Israel as a world power once again. But that wasn't God's intention. Never was. It wasn't the purpose that Jesus came. Jesus literally came to this earth to die on the cross. When we look at Luke uh, 19 and verse 10 and it said the son of man came to seek and save that which was lost that's part of it his death on the cross and so Peter in rejecting that concept was rejecting the very will of God and so Jesus tells him before the cock crows you're going to deny me then we have the, the event that transpires not long after that. Where Peter actually denies the Lord. 
In this context, in chapter 26, the chapter's not even over. And the events begin to unfold where Peter makes the denial. Beginning in verse 69, it says, Now Peter sat without the palace, and a damsel came unto him, saying, Thou also was with Jesus of Galilee. But he denied before them all, saying, I know not what thou sayest. So there's denial number one. And when he was gone out into the porch, another maid saw him and said unto them that were there, This fellow also was with Jesus of Nazareth. And again he denied with an oath, I do not know the man. Denial number two. And after a while came unto him they that stood by and said to Peter, Surely thou art one of them, for thy speech betrays thee. Then began he to curse and to swear, saying, I know not the man. And immediately the cock crew. And Peter remembered the words of Jesus, which said unto him, Before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And he went out and wept bitterly. This account is is, is recorded in all four Gospels in varying degree of detail. In fact, Mark's detail uh, adds that he was going to deny him thrice before the cock crows twice. And so he goes out and he denies him. They record that. And the cock crows. He denies them again. The third time, the cock crows the second time. And he remembered the same. Luke and John record pretty much the same event in the same way. The fact is, Jesus predicted the denial and the cock crows. You know what's interesting about the cock crowing part? I don't know. I grew up with chickens. I didn't grow up with chickens, but we had chickens when I was growing up. I was raised with chickens. But anyway. (laughs) Thank you, Wayne. But anyway, one thing about roosters, you can't keep them from crowing. When a rooster gets it in his mind to crow, he's going to crow. And another thing about roosters, you can't make them crow. You ever notice that about roosters? Maybe if you didn't grow up with roosters, you would know that, but you can't make them crow and you can't stop them from crowing if they've got a mind to. Now think about this event. God kept all of the chickens, all of the roosters from crowing. And then at the right time, he made that rooster crow. God's still in control, Peter. Regardless of what you think, God is still in control. And the the, the betrayal, the trial, and the crucifixion of Jesus is all part of God's plan. And he's carrying it out. Peter wept. If you look at the account and, and keep reading, it says that Jesus looked at him. Jesus looked at him, and he saw Jesus looking at him. Can you imagine the piercing stare of Jesus? And what Peter must have felt having boasted, even though everybody else, yet not I. Everybody else can deny you, but not I. Even if it means my death, not I. And yet, just as Jesus had predicted, just as it was prophesied so long ago in the Old Testament, that the shepherd would be struck and the sheep would be scattered, that came true even among the closest friends of Jesus. Even Peter who boastfully said, not I. 
Peter denied him. I've always thought that was an amazing account. Notice the increased intensity of Peter's denial. First off, it was, I don't know what you're talking about. No, it's not me. And then it was a denial with an oath. Guaranteed, he's guaranteed the denial with an oath. And then it was a denial with curse to invoke divine harm if what is said is not true. So he's becoming more and more emphatic. I don't know him. Then he said, not only did he curse, but he swore to affirm the veracity of one statement by uh, involving or invoking a transcendent entity, in this case, God himself, and his frequently implied invitation of punishment if one is untruthful. Brown Drivers and Briggs is who said those things about those words. So Peter is emphatic in his denial. Even to the point of invoking God's name and incurring the punishment that would be due to someone that lied under those circumstances. And then... There's that rooster. God had stopped the mouth of all the roosters in Jerusalem until the right time for Peter to understand what he had done. And it came to pass just as Jesus said. Peter makes this denial even though he had been with Jesus from the beginning. He had a close association with with Jesus. He was part of what we would call the inner three, the three closest to Jesus, Peter, James, and John. In uh, Matthew chapter 4, verses 17 through 20, it says, From that time Jesus began to preach and to say, uh, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And Jesus said, walked by the Sea of Galilee and saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting nets into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said unto them, Follow me, and I will make thee fishers of men. And they straightway left their nets and followed him. They were with him from the very beginning. Nobody knew Jesus better than Peter. On many occasions when, when Jesus would ask the, a question, Peter would be quick to answer. Matthew chapter 16, verse 13 and following. When Jesus asked the disciples saying, who do you say that I the Son of Man am? It was Peter who answered quickly, thou art the Christ, the Son of God. Peter knew Jesus had a close personal relationship with Jesus in the flesh. I've often heard people say, yeah, it must have been real easy for those people to be faithful because they were right there and they got to see everything. They were with Jesus and knew him personally. As John said, we beheld him with our eyes, we handled him with our hands. 1 John chapter 1. They were there. They were witnesses. Peter was close to him. Now it would be so easy to be faithful if you lived back then and saw those things and was with Jesus. Ask Peter. Ask Peter. Nobody had been with Jesus longer. Nobody was closer than Peter, James, and John and yet Peter denied him. He was there at the healing of his own mother-in-law, Matthew chapter 8, verse 14 and 15. 
He was there. Now think about this. He was there when Jesus walked on water in the Sea of Galilee, Matthew chapter 14, verse 22 through 23. Or through 33, rather. So he, Jesus told them to get in the ship and go across the Sea of Capernaum. There's a storm that comes up. They're not making any headway. They're concerned. And Jesus comes walking to them on the water. And they see him out there and they think he's a ghost and they, they're afraid. And Jesus says, fear not for it's I. Walking on the water. An amazing event. Defies all men, all uh, logic, all physics, all science that we know. Defies gravity. But yet Jesus is doing it. And here's Peter. If it's really you, bid me to come to you. Come. This is the faith of Peter. He gets out of the boat. He steps out of the boat and begins to walk toward Jesus on the water. And what happens? He looks around. He takes his eyes off of Jesus. And he looks around and he sees the boisterous water and he begins to doubt and sink and he cries out, Save me, Lord. And Jesus reached forth his hands. But he had that kind of faith. He was that kind of person. Quick to answer. Not only quick to answer, but answer correctly. He was at the Mount of Transfiguration seeing Jesus speak to Moses and Elijah. Matthew chapter 17 verses 1 through 13. And he wants to build a tabernacle for each. He was there and witnessed that great event. Later writes about it. He was with Jesus when he went to the garden to pray before the crucifixion, before the betrayal and crucifixion on the same night that Peter boasted, not I, though everybody else, not I. Jesus requests his three closest friends in the whole world to come with him to pray. He takes with him Peter, James, and John. And he goes forward a little ways. And he prostrates himself on the ground. And he prays. He prays. Let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will be done. He comes back. And what's Peter, James, and John doing? They're sleeping. Come with me. I'm in anguish this night. Come be with me and comfort me. Still ringing in our ears, isn't it? Peter says, not I. But he couldn't even go and be with him for that time when he needed him the most. He was asleep. Jesus comes back And says what? Watch and pray. Lest you enter into temptation. The flesh is willing, but the spirit is weak. Does that not describe Peter right there? The flesh is willing. Peter, I'm not going to deny you. I'm not going to be offended. Everybody else, but not I. His flesh was willing. But his spirit was weak. Can we learn from his mistakes? We've already seen some. He was boastful. Pride is dangerous. Matthew chapter 26 and verse 33. Peter answered and said that all men, uh, though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet will I never be offended. Pretty bold statement there, Peter. Jesus warned Peter what he would do. 
That's interesting. We've already seen everything that Peter witnessed. The time he spent with, with Jesus. The healing of his mother-in-law, walking on water, the transfiguration, the feeding of the 5,000. We could go on and on. Raising the dead. And now here, at the crucial moment, he begins, gets boastful, prideful. And when Jesus tell him to this night, you're going to deny me three times before the cock crows twice. It's as if he doesn't believe it. He's told in advance what's going to happen. Can we learn something from that? Can we learn something from that? Here's Jesus, Peter, this is going to happen. You know what? Jesus is speaking prophetically. Sometimes we might overlook that. But Jesus is telling Peter, this is what's going to happen. And all, the, all along, Peter said, no, I won't. When God says something's going to happen, it's going to happen. Even if we think not, even if we deny it, it's still going to happen. God's told us some things about the future, about the judgment, about the resurrection, about our accountability, about heaven and about hell and who's going to go each place. We might reject that. We might be like Peter and say, no, no, that's going to happen to everybody else, but not me. Doesn't matter how much we deny something. If God says it's going to happen, it's going to happen the way God said. And it's out of our control to change it. Look at all those Old Testament prophets that spoke to Israel and to Judah, the northern and southern kingdom, and, and trying to get them to do what's right and warn them about the, the captivity that they were going to go into. It was as if they did not believe what the prophets were saying. Sounds a lot like Peter, doesn't it? Denying the foreknowledge of God and the prophetic statements regarding things in our future, we can deny it all we want. It's not going to change the fact. In fact, if we go back in the Old Testament, we can see that proven over and over and over again. And here in this little event in Peter's life, we see this prophetic statement by Jesus that you're going to deny me three times before the cock crows twice. And knowing all that we know about Peter, it may sound astounding to us that he did exactly what Jesus said he was going to do. That's the foreknowledge of God. Jesus knew that Peter was going to become weak in the moment when he needed to be strong. So when we read things in the Bible about things that are going to happen in our future, we need to accept them. And we need to trust in the Word of God. Peter lost his trust in Jesus because the events that were unfolding didn't fit what he thought was supposed to happen. That was his mistake. Apparently, Peter thought himself above temptation. It's not going to happen to me. I think there's a lot of people today who think they are above temptation, but the matter of fact is nobody is above temptation. Too often, we have more confidence in our abilities than we should. When we think about Peter, Christ promised the keys to the kingdom to him. Matthew chapter 16, verse 18 and 19. Peter had left everything to follow Jesus. Mark chapter 10 and verse 28. 
And yet, here's this man that we would think would be faithful given in the temptation. And so, regardless of who you are, regardless of how strong you think your faith is, you're not above being tempted and you're not above being given into that temptation. In fact, you are a great temptation for Satan to get you to fall. Why would I say that? Job. Remember in Job chapter one, when all the sons of men came before God and Satan was with them. And God and Satan enter into a conversation and God says, have you considered my servant Job how there's none like him in all the world? He was a faithful man. And so Satan makes it his business and God allows it to tempt Satan, to, turn, uh, to tempt Job to turn against God. Satan sets his sights high. Nobody's above temptation, even the most faithful. When we compare Job to Peter, Job was successful in resisting the temptation. It says in nothing did Job sin, nor did he charge God foolishly. Can't say that about Peter, right? He did both. He charged God foolishly and he sinned. The destructive nature of pride gets a lot of people in trouble. Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 18. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Matthew chapter 23 and verse 12. Whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased. That's pride. And he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. James 4 and verse 6. James says, but he gives more grace. Wherefore, he says, God resists the proud and gives grace unto the humble. There's consequences to pride. Peter, in his pride, made rash statements and failed miserably. Pride goes before destruction, the haughty spirit before a fall. Peter found out the hard way. Another thing we can learn from Peter's denial is that good intentions aren't enough. Good intentions aren't enough. Somebody once said, and rightly so, the, the, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Intentions aren't what's important. Remember Peter's statement, Matthew 26, verse 35, though I should die, with thee, yet will I not deny thee. And then it's, it's likewise also said all of the disciples. Peter was a bad influence on the other disciples. It's interesting that it doesn't say anything about the other disciples until Peter persists and keeps going with this. And then they all join in. Oh, no, you see, so that's what happens with pride. That's what happens with pride. Maybe they got a little prideful too. They said, well, if Peter's going to say that, it's going to make us look bad, so we need to say it too. Have you ever been in that position where, where you know something's not right and, and you're going to look like an odd duck if you don't go along with what everybody else is saying? What people think of us is important to us. And our reputation is important, but not to the exclusion of the truth. Just because everybody else is saying something doesn't make it right. And we should agree with the things that everybody is saying because it is right. And if it is not right, we shouldn't go along with it just to get along. Just so we won't look different or stand out. When in reality, as Christians, we ought to stand out from the world. We need to be different. Do you think Peter 
intended to deny the Lord? See, he had good intentions when he said what he did. And it might have sounded good to him, and evidently it sounded good to the other disciples because they joined in. But it's actions by which we will be judged. Not our intentions. We can intend to do the right thing. But until we do the right thing, it doesn't matter. We're going to be judged by what we do. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10, it says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one of you may receive the things done in his body according that he has done, not what he intended to do, but what he has done, whether good or bad. Revelation 20 and verse 10, I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of, the, out of those things, uh, are, well, I'm sorry, were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their intentions. No, it doesn't say that. According to their deeds. Peter had good intention. But he's going to be judged according to what he did. If you're a student in school, intending to study doesn't mean you're going to get a good grade, right? Intentions don't get it done in this life, and it certainly doesn't get it done in our spiritual lives. In work, Intending to work doesn't equal a paycheck. Well, I intended to come in today, but I, I just didn't do it. Can I get paid anyway? How long is that going to work? How about never? <laughs> it just doesn't happen that way. It's what we do that counts. Not what we say we're going to do, but what we do. Good intentions are fine as far as they go, but they have to be joined with actions. Peter's actions should have been to confess Christ instead of denying him. That's what he intended to do. Yes, I'm with him. Yes, I know him. I'm a disciple of Jesus. That's what he said he was going to do. But he wasn't joined with actions. But just words. Just empty words. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 6. For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision avails anything nor uncircumcision. Well what does avail? Paul. He tells us. Contrast. Word but. It's not circumcision or uncircumcision. Well, what works? But, he says, patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm sorry. Uh, but faith, rather, which works by love. That's what works. Faith. That's what avails. Faith that works through love. Just simply saying, I believe Jesus isn't enough. We have to do what he says. We have to do what he says. 1 Thessalonians 1 and verse 3. In Paul's prayer for the brethren at Thessalonica, it says, remember without ceasing your work of faith. Look at that work. Labor of love. Look at that labor. And patience of hope. Patience, that's an action. In our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father. That's the things that are commendable. What we do, not what we say we're going to do. Good intentions aren't enough. Without prayer, we are easy prey for Satan. Prayer regarding Peter. Jesus prayed for him, Luke 22, verse 32 and 33. He said, but I have prayed for thee. That thy flesh fail not, and when thou art converted, strengthen the brethren. And he said unto him, Lord, I am ready to go with thee both unto prison and to death. 
still boastful. Jesus praying for him. That he would be strong and live up to his convictions. Jesus instructed him to pray. pray. Matthew 26 verse 39 through 46. So when Jesus was in the garden, Peter, James, and John were there. And notice in this account, in Matthew's account, you don't get it in the other accounts of the gospel, but you get it here. The other, the other accounts, it just says he came back and the disciples were praying. And he told them all, watch and pray, that you enter not into temptation. But in this account, he comes unto the disciples, find them asleep, and he says unto Peter. These con, con, uh, 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 comments... This, this statement is made for the benefit of all, but it's directed to Peter in particular. Now, we can all benefit from the statement that's being said here. Why do you think Peter's mentioned out above the other ones? Because this is not long after he made that bold statement, that rash statement, that prideful statement. He comes back and says to Peter... Could thou not watch with me one hour? What a question. Just a minute ago, Peter, you said you was going to go with me even and die with me. Go to prison and die. Couldn't you just watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing and the flesh is weak. And this happens again and again. Peter failed to heal, heed the warning to pray. His flesh was weak. He was tired. Many have been instructed to pray, but do not. I think one of the greatest tragedies in the Lord's church is that we don't pray the way we ought to pray. We of all people have the ear of God. Because we are his children. We have the right to call him Abba Father. And we need to avail ourselves of that privilege. And we need to pray to God. Because the world can't. Not only are we praying for ourselves. But we're, we're, we're supposed to intercede on behalf of others. We're supposed to offer up supplications and prayers for all men, for, for the kings, for the principalities, for the rulers of the world. Most of them are not in a position to pray for themselves, so it's left to us. And we wonder why the world is in the position that it's in. Maybe it's because Christians aren't praying as they should. I know Peter didn't. I know James and John didn't. Even though they were encouraged to. We need to stay close to the Lord. One thing we read in the account of Luke chapter 22 and verse 54. Then took, he, uh, took they him, talking about Jesus, and led him and brought him into the high priest's house. And Peter followed afar off. At one point, he was warming his hands at the fire of the enemy. But he followed afar off. Peter didn't stay close enough to the Lord. He had been close by when Jesus was popular, even during unpopular times. But this was different. Luke uses the Greek word akalutheo, and it means to follow someone as a disciple, be a disciple or a follower. So Peter's trying to be a disciple from a distance. When it says he followed him afar off, it literally means he was being a disciple from a distance. He was distancing himself from Jesus purposely. It is in the imperfect tense, the imperfect denotes action that is continuous or linear in the past. 
Thus, as Jesus was taken to the high priest's house, Peter continues to follow at a distance. He doesn't try to get up close. He was afraid to be identified as a follower of Jesus. Are we afraid to be identified as a follower of Jesus? With our family? With our friends? What about at work? Are we afraid to be identified with Jesus? Do we follow Jesus? Are we a far off disciple? Are we trying to be a disciple from a distance? When things happen at work and we need to speak up or things happen with our family, we need to speak up. Things happen with our friends, we speak up. Things happen in public, we speak up. Do we do that? Or are we like Peter? And we get so far away from following Jesus that nobody can tell we're a disciple. Or when somebody asks if we're a Christian, how do we answer? Do we deny it? The other apostles, they were scattered. So they did not face this kind of situation and temptation. Matthew chapter 26 and verse 31. Then said Jesus unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. Offended from the Greek word that means to cause to stumble and fall. We need to be cold or hot. We don't need to follow Jesus from a distance. It's better just not to follow him at all. Revelation 3 and verse 15, Jesus says to the church at Laodicea, he says, I know thy works, that thou art neither hot nor cold. I would that you were hot or cold. I doesn't want you to be lukewarm. Sin will multiply before you know it. Sin escalates quickly. Peter denied the Lord three times before he even realized it. Achan saw, coveted, and took the accursed thing. In Joshua chapter 6 and verse 18, God warns, And ye in any way shall keep yourselves from the accursed thing. That's just the spoils of war lest ye make yourselves accursed when ye take the accursed thing and make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it. And yet Achan, in the very next chapter 7, verse 21, it says, when I saw, this is his explanation, I saw the spoils, a goodly Babylonian garment, 200 shekels of silver, and a wedge of gold of 50 shekels weight, then I coveted them, and I took them, and behold, they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent and the silver under it. Notice the progression. He saw it. Does that sound familiar with David? He was up on the parapets, and he saw Bathsheba. He coveted, and he took. So that's the way sin works. That's the way temptation is. It's progressive. I saw, I covered it, I took the accursed thing. All the while knowing that he shouldn't take it. Here's Peter, I'm going to deny you. I mean, I'm going to stand with you, not I. I'm not going to deny you. And Jesus said, yes, you are. He knew he shouldn't, but he did it anyway. First, he just says, no, I'm not with him. Then he said it with an oath. Then he said it with cursing and swearing. See the progression there? It gets worse and worse. We need to remember that Jesus can see us. Jesus can see you. Luke 22, verse 60 and 61, And Peter said, Man, I know not what thou sayest. And immediately, while he yet spake, how he had said unto him, Behold the cock crew. Thou shalt not deny me three times, thrice. Apparently Peter didn't know that Jesus could see him. Look upon is from the Greek verb uh, emblepo, meaning to look at something directly and therefore intently to look at, gaze upon. 
Jesus sees us in the good times and the bad times. God is always watching. Proverbs 15 and verse 3. The eyes of the Lord are in every place. Beholding the evil and the good. And the final. The final thing. There is always the possibility of forgiveness. God always desires to forgive and to save. 1 Timothy 2 and verse 4. Who will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth? God wants everybody to be saved. The Lord showed his concern about Peter. We do a Peter an injustice if we do not recognize that he repented. He affirmed his love for Jesus, John 20, verse 15 through 17. So when they had dined, Jesus said to Simon Peter, son of Jonas, Lovest thou me more than these? And did that three times. You know I love you. Feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. It's obvious that Peter had repented and regretted what he had done, unlike Judas. Jesus had given Peter the keys to the kingdom, Matthew chapter 16 and verse 19. And Peter used those keys on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. And opened the doors to the church and people were added to it for the first time. The Lord is ready and willing to forgive. We can learn these lessons and more from really Peter's bad example. From his bad examples. We can learn from failures just as well as we can learn from success. And sometimes we learn better from failures than from success. Don't be like Peter. When we give the invitation, there may be somebody that's subject to the invitation. But because they're embarrassed or ashamed or fearful or shy or whatever, they won't come forward. They won't come forward to acknowledge their faith in Christ, demonstrate their repentance, make the good confession and be baptized from this of their sins. They're not doing anything. They may have good intentions to do that, but when the time comes to do it, they don't. Are they doing anything better than Peter? Anything worse? May come a time when somebody needs to respond to the invitation. A Christian who's gone back into the world needs to acknowledge that sin publicly because it was committed in a public way and asks us to pray for their forgiveness. We offer the invitation and they have that opportunity to, to acknowledge Jesus and show their faith by coming forward. But through shame or fear or pride or whatever, they sit through one more invitation song. Be like Peter. Recognize your mistake. Swallow your pride. And acknowledge your faith and love for Jesus Christ. That's what he eventually did. Peter, do you love me more than these? You know I do. Do you love Jesus? Are you willing to submit to him in all things? Well, tonight we're going to offer the invitation. And those who are subject to it, I implore you to come forward while we stand and sing.